Today's episode of the Low Ball Show, I'm joined by a former professional footballing referee with over 25 years of experience, um, refereeing at the highest level, cup finals, international fixtures, and many, many more, is John Robotham. John, thanks for joining us today. No problem, it's a pleasure. Um, so, John, I know you, you retired a, a few years ago now uh, from refereeing. What's kind of life been like since? Um, well, the first the first couple of years, I did miss it greatly. Um, so I, I tend to watch it now more than anything else. Uh, obviously, very interested in the VAR situation and that, but uh, I still I still like to watch the football. Um, I was involved in football when I stopped refereeing for a wee while, um, but I decided to give that side of the things up, the supervising and that, and... Uh, Basically, just uh, give my family some time back, you know. Yeah, and with you obviously mentioning the the VAR, I mean, how do you think you would have handled using VAR on a regular basis? Well, do you know, I've, <laughs> obviously, some of my mates and that have asked me about that, and if I'm given the the, the honest answer, I would have liked it. Um, I just feel that there's less pressure on the referee now. Yeah. Um, the referee has, um, if you want, another pair of eyes, you know, watching it on screen. Um, and I just feel that the pressure on the referee to make that instant decision has been minimised slightly. So I think, if I'm being honest, I think I would have liked to have a shot at that, yeah. You know, with the, the VAR being, being introduced in, in the way it has been, um, and you know what, I totally agree, it probably takes pressure from referees do you think it's been utilised to the full potential or do you think there's still kind of tweaks and things to be made before we see that I think we're still learning but I think I think from a from a fan's perspective I think when everybody was calling for VR, I think they thought immediately that VR was introduced that all the problems would go away uh, and I think that's pretty evident that all the problems haven't, haven't went away um, it, it's still we still need to look at um, various things, but I don't think I don't think so far I don't think it's been a, a complete success. However, I think we have to move move with the times, and you know, cross any any problems that that we come to, and, and and try and do it in the best way. And the people, the people, the powers that be, they're the ones along with the referees who have to try and get it right. To look over, you know, your own career. I mean, you. You uh, refereed in you know, many, many uh, range and, and variation of, of games. And I, I'm going to guess that this is a game that you've been kind of asked about numerous times. Um, if you look back to the 1999 Old Firm game. with Rangers uh, versus Celtic at Ivory yeah. uh, uh, Parkhead. Yeah, because you were the, the fourth official, I believe. Now, is that the one with Hugh Dallas and the yes. coins? Yeah, yeah, I was the fourth official that yeah. day, yeah. And now the, the question, and I'm assuming you've been asked a lot in regards to the, the, the kind of instincts and things like that, but what, one of the kind of first questions that I kind of had on it was when it's it's leading up to, you know, such a, you know, the, the, the kind of biggest rivalry in, in Scotland and, and a, one of the most high-profile games in Scotland, I mean, is there is there elements of excitement from your point in, in being involved in the game in that capacity or is it is there kind of nerves what's the emotions like getting into that from where John, you there's are? every every possible emotion you can have um the excitement of getting appointed to the fixture and um, then the you know you know the problems that sometimes that fixture can um uh, come up with so there's the nervousness and uh, there's anticipation of um hopefully it being a great game great atmosphere there was the the pressure on on Hugh off that you know almost been a title decider 
Um, so there's lots of different emotions, lots of different pressures. But I think all the referees are in it to referee the big games, you know, and you know that game's sitting there waiting to be refereed. So, um, yeah, I, th I think excitement, nervousness, but lots and lots of different emotions. And just, I suppose, kind of briefly on that game specifically, I mean, after the game, when, you know, when you put when the game ends and, and you go down the tunnel, what was the kind of emotions like after it, based in the game that had just occurred? Well, obviously, our first thought was, was for a colleague, for Hugh, you know, um, you know what had happened to him, the fact he was hit with a coin, the pressure on him, the fact he was uh, brave to go out and do the second half, because I suppose, uh, you know, I could have went out and done the second half, but Hugh, you know, Hugh stood up to the pressures, showed what a great referee he is. Um, and then back in the dressing room, obviously, you know, the, making sure that Hugh was okay, but believe it or not, <laughs> We still had paperwork to do, you know. So you, you've got you've got the tasks. You have to remain professional, um, and get the paperwork done. Because as I say, there was there were sending offs. There was there was various things. So all that has to be done as well. Um, but I think first and foremost, you know, it was concern for Hugh. Would would it be fair to say that probably throughout the many games that you've refereed throughout the you kind know, of over twenty years that that was probably one of the most, with, with the amount of incidents and, and you know what happened to uh, to Hugh during that game. Would it be fair to say that that was probably one of the the few games that you've had kind of experiences to that level? Oh, domestically, it was it it, it definitely was. I don't think there was anything <clears throat> um, compared to what actually happened that day. So domestically, without a doubt, um, you don't expect. You know, a referee to get hit with a coin like that, to, to have to get medical attention. Um, and obviously the atmosphere, as the game wore on because of what happened, the atmosphere was just increasing, increasing, increasing the tension in the ground. Um, so, yeah, domestically, I don't think there's anything ever that compares to what happened that day. You know, mo moving from, from kind of that, because I'm, I'm sure that's probably a, a game that gets brought up to you quite frequently. <laughs> Yeah, that yeah, that and the Rangers Aberdeen game when uh, yeah, the Ibrox, yeah. So yeah, that's probably the one um that, that people ask about a lot. Yeah, the Celtic Rangers game that day. But looking, you know, throughout your career, I mean, you've you know, shared the pitch with players like, you know, Maldini, Ronaldo, Raul, you know, domestically, Larson, Loudrop. I mean, what what is it like refereeing players that come with such a big stature in football? Being a football fan, as well as you know, being a being a referee, it was magnificent. Um, to to be on the pitch with those players that you mentioned, and to be on stadiums like you know the San Siro and and things like that, and to be going abroad and represent your country, um, and and refereeing and, and being in all these players. But knowing that you had a job to do, you know, you couldn't let these players dominate you. Um, but the sensation as a, as a football fan was magnificent. You know, all the players that you mentioned there are, are all, you know, well known in the football world. And it was absolutely brilliant, um, you know, domestically. And then you're going abroad and you find out what game you're doing. You're going to San Siro, you're going to see AC Milan. And then you've got to go, uh, stop. Uh, we've, we've got a job to do here. Um, but it was just a magnificent feeling. And, you know, with you saying about being a football fan, has there ever been an occasion for you where you've maybe met a player through the, the kind of refereeing when you're going to be officiating a game and been in a bit of, you know, awe of that player and maybe asked for the, the autograph or was it always strictly professional? Yeah, I've never asked for the autograph. <laughs> I, I've never, I've never asked the autograph. Um, I, I wish I, I wish I could have done, you know. But um, if you're doing a Rangers Celtic game or doing an international game or doing a, a club, a UEFA Champions League, it wouldn't be the best idea going with your autograph book into the AC Milan dressing room and saying, uh, "Hey, pal, well, any chance?" Uh, you know, because they just probably look at you as much and say, "Why are you on?" But they, you know, it, it it was immense just to 
to be there and to be on the pitch with them. But unfortunately, um, the autograph hunting, yeah, you know, that wouldn't have seemed too professional. I saw actually during the week that the the English referee uh, do not do he was signing autographs for the fans, you know, which happened to me once. Um, only once the the fan asked me for an autograph when I was in Salonica. Uh, one of the wee ball boys shouted me across and asked for my autograph. And as I was signing it, all the other wee ball boys were coming across. And I thought, wow, wee boy for Kirkcaldy here, you know, they're asking for my autograph. And when I signed it, in perfect English, he turned to the other little boys and said, no, no, it's not Kalina. So they obviously, <laughs> so they obviously thought that that was maybe Kalina. And then when they realised it was Robo that was getting signed, they didn't want the rest of them, didn't want the autographs. So. <laughs> <laughs> but but somewhere though there is that uh, boy with that ball with that autograph. Yeah, all oh, right. He's got my well. I don't know. He's maybe not kept. He's maybe thought you know if he if he kept. He's shown his fans if it was Kalina. He's shown his friends and his family. But it's shown it was Robotham. He probably went, nah. Don't bother with that <laughs> one. You know. <laughs> I mean, I suppose when you go internationally to referee a game, and because of you now they can have wide scale of football, you know, some of the clubs that we've, we've mentioned here and the variation of players that they get in. Do you ever find any kind of language barriers? <laughs> we, we, we often get asked about that. I often found that if they wanted something, i.e. penalty foul, throw in, wanted to see someone, um, their English was perfect. <laughs> but when you wanted, you know, when you wanted to speak to them, you know, or tell, you know, talk to them about a free kick, all of a sudden, you know, no speaking English, no understanding, you know. <laughs> so, and you knew fine, you knew fine that English was English was the, sort of the language that was used. Uh, European, you know, you, you had to all the the teams that had to have a good command of English. The referees have to have a good command of English. But funnily enough, their English seemed to desert them when uh, things when they go in their way. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I know obviously when you're you're refereeing, you're officiating in a game and you've got, you know, the different instances that can occur, whether it's just the game flowing, fouls, different things that go on. But based on the kind of many games, whether it be domestically or um, Europe, international, what's it like refereeing managers during games? (laughs) <laughs> the, beauty, the beauty of a lot of these games, the, the higher profile games, is the beauty of it in our day and probably even still to this day is you've got a fourth official who c- can deal with those guys. And I think 99% of the time, or 100% of the time, if you were if you were getting called across by the fourth official um, to speak with a manager, it wasn't to ex- exchange uh, pleasantries. It was usually to... You know, to send them for a nice comfy seat in the stand. So <laughs> it was always good. It was always good to have that fourth official there. However, obviously domestically in particular, you know, you had your your first and second division games um, where you had to deal with the managers. Some managers, it was like guys like Dick Campbell, fellow Pfeiffer, easy to deal with. We spoke the same language, and uh, you kind of just got on with it. Other managers maybe didn't quite accept. Uh, your explanation, um, but it's just something you had to deal with. That was that was probably one of the things you you had to be good at was man management. Um, you knew the laws of the game, but the man management side was really uh, important. You know, you, you mentioned that there um, you're having uh, somebody like uh, Dick Campbell there, um, who in you know football is a complete kind of character. I mean, when you look at you know the kind of the, the old kind of first, second division and things in uh, Scotland and kind of domestically. What was it like going to these games in comparison? Because obviously their games was a lot more on yourself as an official. Well, the, the thing is that you have to remember it, you know, in respect of what division, these guys, these guys are expecting you to, to maintain the same high standard, whether you're internationally, whether you're domestically, whether it's Premier League. These guys are looking for you to to get the laws of the game, and uh, you're having to do the same job. Probably the only difference is that when there's only a, a small crowd, um, you heard all the comments. You know, <laughs> you heard them individually, whether they whether they be pleasant or non pleasant. Whereas at a big game, it was just one kind of roar, and you thought, well, I don't think the fans agree with that decision. <laughs> Whereas you know, when it's when it's two men and a dog, you know, you, you heard all the insults. You know, your personal appearance. You know, you. Uh, 
anything to do with how they think you're refereeing. So that that was probably that probably made me smile a, a few times. Some of the because some of the guys are really clever, you know. Some of them are really clever when they come out with some comments. So yeah, yeah, it was uh, it was it was good fun even in the lower division. But they they were entitled to have the same high standard as Premier League international. So you had to prepare for your game in the same way. And I'm I'm glad you kind of brought it up there because it is something that you know, I've asked many guests whether they've been you know directors, players, managers. Um, now I, I love being able to ask it to uh, an official, a referee. The shouts that you've heard, especially in the kind of you know the games where there isn't many fans there, has there ever been one that kind of sticks out that you heard that's you know, always kind of stuck with you and made you laugh? Uh, well, there is, but I can't really say that on uh, on the radio <laughs> or podcast, or anything, because you can't use language like that. Just the kind of, they, descri- they, 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 they did a personal description of what I looked like. It's probably the best way I could put it. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, without because obviously most of the football language, it, it wasn't intended to offend as such, but obviously there was always a few swearies, you know, in between each word. And sometimes it, it was the reverse. There was a wee word in between the swearies. So, <laughs> you know, okay. so, so there was, it was more, it was more, more swearies than, than what it actually, actually was. But um, the, the insults that some of them, some of them, were, it was the usual, it was the usual, you know, if you, if you left your guide dog in the, in the dressing room, breath, you know, especially when, Spec savers took over, you know, and spotted the referees. You know, that was that was that was a favourite. You know, uh, so ah, they were always they were always quite quite amusing, uh, the guys, and uh, it was always you could hear it in the lower divisions more than the the, the bigger leagues. When you know going through in domestically as well, and the and the referee, and I mean, what's the the process? How early do you know? what games you're going to be involved in? I think it's slightly different now, but in our day, you know, and, and we're talking, you know, I retired in 2005, so you're, you're talking pre-2005. Uh, we we used to get, we used to get a, a, a ballot. Um, it was a little booklet. It was about six weeks ahead of various games. Um, and towards the end of my career, that kind of slightly got changed. You, you didn't find out so far ahead. But the bulk of my career was done through a little booklet that would give you six weeks in advance of when you were refereeing, you know, what you were doing. So it gave you a good chance to prepare quite well. Um, I think the system's slightly different now, um, especially in Europe. Um, you know, in Europe, I think uh, we used to get asked where we're available for a, uh, to do a game in such and such a place. Yeah, I said, now I think they're asked if they're, I'm not sure, but I think it's not a case of uh, are you available to do a game on a certain date, and very it's near to the time they actually find out. Well, we found out, you know, a week or two beforehand. So it was done by it was done in a ballot in a little booklet six weeks ahead. How was that for yourself as well? Because also I know we we spoke about it briefly at the beginning, um, but you know, in regards to the amount of travelling and things, was that something that you? you can anticipate it, you know, it was always a potential when you first get into refereeing of happening. Do you mean domestically and internationally? Because yeah. obviously domestic, you never know if you're going to become an international referee or not. That You know, that's based on your performances and things like that. Um, domestically, it didn't, you know, didn't bother me if it was way up north or way down the borders, you know, so that, that wasn't a problem. And likewise, um, internationally, when I did become an international referee, um, in my job, you know, I did various jobs, mainly in the confectionery industry. Um, I used to, you know, you were away for three days at a time, but I always told the management if I was to take a new job off, what would happen? I'd be away the day before, the day of the game, and then the day after I'd come back. So that didn't really cause me any problems, no. Looking over, you know, fr- from your, your perspective and on, on your career, when you would maybe referee a game and, you know, whether it be a domestically, you know, first, second division game or a, a high-profile, you know, televised international game, if you 
because obviously, you know, hindsight retrospect's a, a kind of great thing. And now, now we discussed up where VAR's there and they can kind of step in and take a lot of pressure yeah. off the referees. But for yourself in a time when that wasn't the case and you would have perhaps gave a decision in a game and do you look back on the games or after it to see if that was the correct decision to have made or would somebody tell you? No, two things. Right, like, yeah, um, uh, I was really quite self-critical. I would, I would come mm. home, and the funny thing I, I find as a referee is, I was able to replay a lot of the game in my mind. In particular, the incidents, penalty, you know, offside, free kick. But, you know, I was there were certain incidents you were able to replay in your mind. Um, and obviously, the beauty of that was there was a an observer, a supervisor, as we call them, an observer in the stand who was there assessing your performance, to which um, usually the day after, and let's say it was a Saturday game on the Sunday, they would phone you up and discuss one or two points if they wanted clarification on anything. Um, and they, they would then give you a report. During the meeting, you'd get a report from the SFA on your performance, different aspects of your performance, your position, your fitness, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I was definitely self-critical. I would come home and it didn't matter whether it was internationally, whether it was um, Premier League, whether it was first, second, third division, because I, I strongly believe that these guys deserved the quality of performance, didn't matter what you were doing. So, yeah, I, I was self-critical. Um, and I would try and make it, although self-critical, I would try and see if I could improve my performance the next time if I thought there was one or two problems that I caused by not refereeing the game properly. How do you deal, because obviously in talking in decisions, and, you know, it's... In, in any walk of life, we're going to make mistakes. Um, yeah. Obviously, in the, the area of in, you know, based on what your role is, if if you make a mistake, there's, depending on the level, there can be many thousands or a handful of people that are uh, upset by that. But after a game, if a manager, for example, wanted to speak, how how do you handle that kind of situation? Probably depending on how, probably depending on the manager. Set managers you could probably bring into your dressing room and have a, shall we put an in inverted commas, a discussion with. Uh, other managers, you would know that the best idea was probably not to discuss after the game. Um, so I, I kind of judged on how I felt, what kind of person the manager was before I would invite them in because you know yourself if a manager's upset the last thing you want is five minutes after the game the manager would be knocking on the door to come in because it wouldn't be would you like to come in for a cup of tea and a wee biscuit you know it wouldn't be that kind of discussion yeah. however I think there was a time where they suggested that managers were allowed to were able to approach the referee 15 minutes after the game when they've maybe calmed down if they're not happy because in fairness in fairness John there was there was some manager who'd come in and, you know, the likes of Dick Campbell and people, are, if they thought you had had a, a decent enough game and they would knock on the door and just pop their head down and say, oh, big man, good game, you know, daddy, daddy, there. Admittedly, that was nine times out of ten if they'd won the game. You know, <laughs> they didn't they very often come in and knock on the door after they'd been gubbed five nothing and say, well done, big man, you had a great game. <laughs> so so I, I really, depending on the personality of the manager, I'd be quite happy for him to come in uh, and discuss give his feelings I could put over my point and then, you know, shake hands in a way. But there was, it, you depended on the personality of the manager before you could do that, yeah. I suppose just to, um, just kind of briefly touch on that with the, the kind of personality of the manager and things that come through, was there ever a time where you had allowed the manager to come in for a discussion and maybe regretted it? Uh, <clears throat> I never, I never, no, I never regretted it. I never regretted it. Um, I never regretted the manager coming in because, because I was I judged the personality of the manager. There was times where it, it probably started to get a little bit heated, and I was able to say, "Look, I think we'd better stop this now before, you know, I have to take the manager up to the SFA and report him for, you know, and getting a bit uh, excitable." So there was a couple of times where maybe I had to cut short a little discussion and I think the managers appreciated that because sometimes you'd see them the next time and you'd, they'd say to you, you know, Jim Jeffries was a a real nice guy 
But when that whistle, when that whistle goes, these guys are passionate. You know, these guys are passionate. Their, their jobs are on the line. Uh, and, and you know, Jim would, Jim could come into your dressing room and I would I would bring Jim in because I would knew that if it started getting a little bit heated, I could say to Jim, tell you what, I think we should stop this now. And Jim would go, aye, you know, maybe you're right, you know. Um, so, and big Terry Butcher, you know, big Terry, big guy, big strong looking guy, you know, he would come in and on the proviso and being all nicey nicey. And maybe if things get said that I'm not agreed with, if it gets a wee bit heated, your best just to cut it short. And I must admit, 99% of the time, I found it beneficial to speak to the managers um, because the next time it kind of created that thing that you realised that you were human you know and it took away that barrier of oh I'm a manager you're a referee so I was quite happy to do that One of the other things that I, I just kind of wanted to um, can ask especially when, when we look at the kind of areas and the, in the level that you had refereed at I mean obviously we all kind of see it you know as football fans and, and following football and things that some people players perhaps come with reputations of you know for example diving or whatever it may be how do you kind of handle how did you handle that again and again would that be something that you would think well they're renowned for and it's been highly publicized that and they've perhaps been um, kind of caution, sanctioned, whatever it might be for it previously. Is that something that you look at before a game or do you very much try and take it as much of face value as you can? You know, for me personally, obviously, you know, without naming names, you would know of certain situations, certain players, you know, before you go into the game. But you had to be aware not to overreact to that. And as you say, you had to take that at, on the day at face value. Um, don't anticipate the fact that if a player's going into the box, he's going to go down automatically just because he's done it in the past. Because you're preempting, you're preempting the situation, and that could get you in loads of trouble. So take it on face value. Take it on face value. And I always find, especially with players who might be a little bit heated on the on the pitch, I just turned off my hearing aid. Uh, I found that I found that a much easier way to deal with players. Um, because their frustration then, they, they get frustrated at something else. Um, so very much at face value, but very much doing your homework to prepare, you know, how players might react on the, uh, on the pitch. And that's all part and parcel of, I think, being a good referee to, is to prepare what might happen. But at the same time, don't overreact to what you think is automatically going to, a player's going to do because he's done it the week before. So you have to be very careful. Did you find because of it, you know, the length of time that you refereed for, that with some you know, players that you would start to kind of know them, so would that make the refereeing of them slightly easier at times when they very much knew that oh, they're, they're not going to get away with that or you're not going to change your decision? Do you know what I found? I found that during my career, the best, the best way that I found the refereeing was if you're on first name terms with just about everybody on the park. I thought it brought down a barrier, you know, to to be saying to players, Mister Such and Such, come here, you know, saying things like, hey, Billy, Tam, you know, come here and let's have a wee chat. And they'd come over, and it got to the stage where they kind of knew me as Big Man or or John or you know, and I I felt that cut down on a few barriers, you know, that I wasn't that that the person of authority who they couldn't speak to, you know, they could speak to in certain times. And I always thought that that, that worked for me, you know, broke down that those barriers of being that that person that they couldn't approach. Uh, uh, obviously, sometimes they kind of overstepped the mark. Um, I just found that if you could speak to them, not like, a, not like a mate, but just speak to them normally without this authoritarian way of working. It worked with most of the players. So that's just kind of the way I approached the game. To get back to obviously I know we, we spoke about, you know, being a football fan and, and being able to watch the game in, in numerous games. Is there ever times where you've maybe yourself having been a, a referee and you know at the highest level for so long, have you ever watched a game and, and kind of sat and felt yourself maybe critiquing the referee? 
Yeah. Let me tell you something. Yeah. Not so much critiquing, but just thinking to yourself. I remember years ago after that, as I'm a uh, Finnish referee and that, I support Wraith Rovers. I mean, all the referees are involved in football, probably support or follow the team in the younger days, and that's why they've got. But I, I will, I, after I stopped refereeing, I went to see Wraith Rovers in Dunfermline, big derby game. And I forgot it was on the telly. And I was, I was doing the front, and I think Rovers didn't get a penalty in it. I was off. I was I was doing the front. Nah, man, you know, I was giving it loudy. Only to my horror realised it. I kind of been caught on on film, you know, on the telly. I thought, geez, oh, look at that. Luckily, I had a Tommy and everyone, but I knew it was me. And <laughs> I thought to myself, behave yourself, you know, behave yourself. You know what it's like. You know what it's like being a referee. But that's what emotion does to a lot of fans and players, you know. You just forget in that split second that the referee's just giving his opinion. He, okay, as you said earlier on, you know, everybody makes a mistake. But it just shows you the passion, the passion of the game, you know. But I watch a lot of football on television now, but I never critique the referee because I know sitting here watching the telly, it's so much easier watching the game because football's all about angles, you know, which direct, where you see it from the speed of the game and nowadays how fast it is. Referees yeah. got to make decisions. They've got the VAR now. So that helps. So I never I, I don't I don't sit here and go, oh referee, that's terrible. I maybe sit and go, I think I might have done that differently. However, that's easy for me sitting watching the telly. It's no so easy, you know, when you're on that park and you've got to make that that instant decision. And I suppose as well it's it's easy when you're refereeing to think Oh, look at those fans giving me pelters. If only they knew to then many years later be that guy down the front. <laughs> exactly, exactly, you know. But the funny thing is, if I go to a game, I thought I've got a game and the the the, uh, the punters are not happy. Uh, it's not the referee gets I get it in the neck. They go, what, grow with them, what about that? Get on there and tell him, you know, that's, that's shocking. You get back on that park. And then I think to myself, that's probably the same guys that used to say, Robotham, you're rubbish. Get off that part. You know? <laughs> so, so I, it's, you know, football is such an emotional game. You know, it's such an emo- I've seen the most placid of guys, you know, for, uh, I've got a good mate who is the nicest guy you would ever meet. But boy, when his team are on that part, he turns into some kind of animal, you know, um, and it's just an emotional game. That's all. And, you know, I, I, I travel about and I watch a, a lot of the, um, yeah, a lot of games at all different levels, um, from the kind of Lowland and Highland leagues, um, all the way up. And j- just for you saying that, because I was at, uh, a-, a while back, I was at an Albion Rovers game, and they were, it was either nil nil or one each, but they were drawn anyway, and the fans were really starting to get, you know, very emotional that they weren't winning the game and they were becoming very vocal. You could kind of feel a bit of tension. Literally with about 90 seconds to go, they scored to win the game. And it was as if they had been 6 nothing up the full game. All that was forgotten. Yeah. And yeah. everybody was great. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's absolutely amazing. It's absolutely amazing. Um, because I watch, obviously, you know, the way Ray Throws are going just now, they had a really good spell. The fans were, oh, yeah, great, you know, fantastic. The manager's doing really well. Then they had a wee spell, I think, with four or five games when they did, they went, all of a sudden, oh, you know, these substitutions are no right. And it just, it's amazing how football can turn. And that's what makes it a fantastic game, you know. It's such an emotional sport. And, and the highs and lows, the ups and downs, are just magnificent. I just, I love watching the fans. It's, it just, it really is, it's a great game. And I suppose you used to talk, obviously, yeah, I appreciate the, the Wraith Rovers, um, the, the team that you follow, the team you support. When you were refereeing, did you really get to have that same enjoyment of being a, with following your team and being a fan? Well, I mean, I still followed them, but at the same time, <laughs> uh, you know, refereeing was was a career. It was a job I had to do professionally. Um, and irrespective of what was happening to them, I just had to concentrate on what I was doing. But you know, I still, you know, I was still interested in, and you know, um, it was just, I was a football fan um, when I wasn't refereeing. When I was refereeing, I was, I was refereeing, and I was, I was out there to do a job. I was out there to try and treat the players uh, fairly. 
I was out there to try and do a professional job. Um, and I was out there trying to make sure that I just did the 90 minutes as it should be under the laws of the game. So it kind of, you kind of split yourself, you know, into two, you know, um, when you're at home socially, yeah, you know, you, you, you followed your team, but when you were doing your job as a referee, you were doing your job as a professional, you had a job to do. Another thing which is slightly away from football, but it was something I read and I, I just wanted to ask you, which uh, I hope's okay. Um, in an interview you done a while ago, when uh, I think it was a, a wee bit after you'd retired, you said you had taken up baking, and I was just wondering if that was still something that you'd done. I knew that would come up, because that comes <laughs> up. Because <laughs> the amount of times that people are saying to me, big man, you're a better baker than you were a referee. You know, <laughs> so... Uh, do you know what I started COVID? I'd never baked a cake in my life. My mum was a my mum was a fantastic baker. Um, and I'd never baked a cake in my life. And I was watching the bake off with my a couple of my grandkids and they were making a Victoria sponge and they were making a hash it. And I says, How the could that be? And they challenged me to do it. So I made one and it kind of uh, mine was like the bake off, it was kind of rubbish. So I thought, I'll have another go. And then all of a sudden, just each week, I thought, I'm gonna try something else. And now once a week. Uh, I do some kind of cake or um, biscuits, and I and I started this thing. I put it online. I put it on Facebook with my Facebook friends, and I started this thing. I said, "I'm out to the tent today, and I've made this." And then one or two of my friends started saying, "Have you really got a tent in your back garden?" And I'm like, "No, that's just <laughs> play on the bake off thing, you know." I says, "I just so I just put stupid things out there." Every you know when I put it on Facebook for my friends, I say, "Here's what it is this week, and Daddy did." So I I do it once a week because now I'm retired, and it's just something that it's interesting. It's quite therapeutic, actually. And can I just say as well, um, baking something I'd actually and I, I've spoke about this before. I'd love to be good at. I'm terrible at. I've tried. It's it's not for me. However, tasting things, I'm great at. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so what you're now doing to do is send me an address and expect a little box. Is that what you're telling me? I mean, I mean, you know, I'll send the address. Whatever comes my way, comes my way. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll tell you what I'll do. You. If you send me your address, if I'm ever out there and I've got your address and I know I'm heading out that way, I'll be in contact with you, mate, and I'll guarantee you I'll bring you something nice, a wee bit of caramel shortcake, maybe a shortcake or something like that. You know, it would be great then having a, a podcast where I'll just, I'll just sit. And I'll just eat. <laughs> eat, my stuff. Eat, eat the selection. Yeah. I just bring you a selection. <laughs> Do you know, I'm now thinking, forget the football podcast. That perhaps sounds the way to go. I've been doing this wrong for a while. <laughs> well, last night, last night I had last night I made some uh, all butter shortbread because I'm going through the west this weekend. I'm going to see some friends, so. Um, uh, I made some shortbread, all butter shortbread last night, and I'm going to do some double biscuits today. So I take a wee sample through to my friends through Greenock Way. Just the, the, the kind of final wee bit on the, the refereeing in the football. Um, and it's just looking at, I mean, obviously, you know, over the years, and as high profiled as, as you were as a referee, I'm assuming you've done many kind of interviews, spoke to, to many, uh, many people over the years. How has it been having that kind of publicity, you know, where people know who you are through the job that you do? Well, obviously, when we, you know, the, the guys that were around, you know, Hugh, Hugh Dallas, well, Young and all that, myself, Kenny Clark, and, and we, were, we were high profile because of the games that we were doing. And Sky took up Scottish football early on and, you know, promoted it quite, quite well. And, yeah, so you knew you were in the public eye. What what has surprised me is I retired in 2005 and 19 years later, uh, you hear people standing behind me going, hey, that's Robotham, that's the referee. And, and it's amazing the fact that people still recognise you and still want to speak to you because they'll come up and say, I know you've had this question asked you before, but who was your favourite player? So in the middle of the street and that, and you know and <laughs> Do you know something? I actually don't mind it. I think myself, well, do you know, that's that's quite good that people still want to come up and, and approach you and, and, and that kind of thing. So I'm quite happy with that. And I'm still amazed that 19 years later that that, that still happens, you know? Again, a, another wee bit that I, I kind of felt that I, I wanted to, uh, to say, 
Um, and it wasn't something that I'd expressed to you before this, but I remember I'm 36 this year, so I was probably probably a number of years ago. I wouldn't say how many, but probably a number of years ago. And I was invited by a couple of friends along to a sportsman's dinner. Yeah. And it was yourself and the, the other person on it was Alan Ruff. Oh, all right, Ruffy, yeah. Um, it was it was both years, and I genuinely remember. Uh, I, I remember the the night. I, I remember kind of a lot about it. I, when I had a, obviously we had a, a brief discussion prior um, about you coming on, and I've got a kind of group chat with a few of my friends um, who are just kind of football fans. A few of us, and I talk about the kind of podcast, and people ask me who's coming on, and I mentioned that you were coming on, and. These are the same group of friends that I was at that night with. Uh, every one of them then started firing out stories and things he said. And it was funny because it took us a while to remember other people that were there that night because you had the entire place uh, in the, you know, kind of engrossed in uh, what you were doing. That's really nice to say. That's really nice to say because I'm not a comedian. Um, so I'm telling football stories, but you've got to try and make them interesting as well. So it's really nice that people can come on and, and say that, you know, they enjoyed, they enjoyed the, the content of it. And I know Ruffy in that as well. Ruffy's the same. Ruffy just tells football stories. And I think that's the best way to do it. Just stick to what you know. We have comedians on the after dinner circuit who are brilliant comedians. So you leave that to them and you just tell your football stories and, if it's a football crowd, um, just try and make them believe they're at that game that you're talking about. So, yeah, it's really nice of you to say, and it, you know, it's quite enjoyable, yeah. And, and you know, as I said, and, and, and I appreciate that, but it's a uh, thousand percent um, true. I don't <laughs> I, I don't want you to think I, I butter up every <laughs> guest that comes on because a few that I've actually kept really friendly with since would tell you that I don't. Um, and it's not just because there's baking involved here. <laughs> I, was just going to well. say, I was going to say, you're doing it like a cake, you won't you? <laughs> but the, the, the final um, footballing question I suppose I have is, I'm, I'm right in saying, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that when you had retired, it wasn't your choice, you kind of had to. Yeah, an age retire. thing, yeah. Yeah. Now, if, if you don't mind me asking do you feel that for yourself personally that that you know looking at it and you're going well do you know what actually that's was probably best kind of all round of what else you've been able to kind of do and you know kind of socially yeah. and kind of career and things moving on or did you think I wouldn't have minded having another year or, or whatever it might have been but getting out when it was yourself or do you prepare for that because I'm assuming you know that it's coming. Yeah, I knew I knew <clears throat> it was coming. I knew it was coming. Um, and and two things to it. Um, yeah, I, I was disappointed because I was as fit at fifty as what I was at forty. Uh, and it, you know, fitness was never a problem for me. I got about the park, and it, and that wasn't a problem. But at the same time, I realised there is a production line of referees. There's young referees waiting to go on. And if, if I'm still running about at 55, these younger referees are now five years older and, and they might not get, you know, to become a, a, a class one referee until they're slightly older. And then you have to balance it up with, in Europe, you know, there were, at that time, I don't think they can do it now, this ages, ageism thing, but at that time in Europe, there was an age limit which was going to be reduced from 50 down to 47. So the longer I'm on as an older guy, these younger guys weren't getting a chance to come through. I'd had a great career. I'd, I'd, I'd loved everything I did. So I was, I was, I knew it was coming. I got out in the cup final, which was magnificent. That, that was a great day for me. So when I sat down and looked at it, I thought to myself, really enjoyed my career. It's only fair now that I maybe give the chance to some of the younger guys to come through and make that space for another another referee who wants to to make it to the top. So I was delighted with what I did. I was really happy with what I did. And 
when I look back on it, I was it was right that I maybe stepped aside and let somebody else have a go at what I had really enjoyed. So I was quite happy with it, yeah. Do, and again, just because you'd mentioned it then, it, it's something that, again, I've asked whether it's been players or uh, managers, directors, things like that. When, when you look over your career, is there any mementos that you've kind of held throughout your career? Oh, I've got stuff. I've got gifts that have been given um, legally, not illegally. <laughs> uh, um, mementos like I've got a beautiful glass football, um, which I got when I did a European game. Um, and obviously domestically, uh, when I did the when I did the um, Scottish Cup final to finish, I got the Jack Mowat Trophy, which is a, a major thing for a referee to get your to get the Scottish Cup final. Um, I've got football strips. I've got pennants. I've got programs. Um, I've got stuff that I've given away to people who have asked me things for charity. Um, there was something happened down in Ayrshire, and they were having a charity for a, a, some a couple of uh, children who who were not too well. And I had a, I had a, Chris Boyd had given me his Kilmarnock top on my last game at Kilmarnock, uh, so I had the pleasure of giving that to the charity so that so they could. And so I had lots of lots of great memories of of memorabilia that I was able to keep. And also, maybe give something away to to a, a, a charity. So, um, I, I remember Lubo Maravchik's last game. It was a he did a, a little charity game, and I asked they asked me if I wanted a fee, and I said I don't want a fee. I says give me his top. So I got Lubo Maravchik's top, and then my friend who was a Celtic supporter was running a charity night, and he said, "Have you got any stuff that you could give him?" So I said, "Brilliant! Here you are. There's a there's a Lubo Maravchik shirt for charity." And he, Got something like four hundred quid for it, and I thought, oh, that's great." But I've I've got a lot of stuff that I kept for myself, so it's been great to be able to do that, keep it for yourself, and be able to maybe give it away to a charity that you know that can make good use of it. So, yeah. great memories, great memories. And the final question is a more of a non-football question, but it's a question that every guest has been asked, um, and it actually is is quite a, an interesting one. Um, so I, I hope again you don't mind. Um, if there was to be a film made about your life, and you could pick who played you, who would you choose to play you? Wow, who would I? Who is? There's so many. But there's so many bald guys. There's so many bald. <laughs> can, can I quickly say that I, I was in that? Did you ever see that, the the blockbuster? A shot at glory. Oh, I love the film. Yes. Yeah. So I was I was refereeing the final. Uh, you know, so we were at Hamden doing the filming and everything. And the funny story about that is, do you remember the situation with Paul Gascoigne when uh, he dropped, he dropped the, uh, the referee dropped the card and the right. So, so after the filming, a couple of days later, I got a phone call saying that the director wanted to reshoot a scene where I dropped my card and a player is to pick it up and flash it. So I went, oh, sorry. I says, I'm working full time. I can't do that. Well, I can't believe it. I got a stunt double. They got a guy with a shaved head and the, the, they redid the scene. But the only thing was, because the guy had shaved his head, you kind of saw the dark shadow, which I didn't have, you know. <laughs> so I, I, I've had a stunt, a stunt double. So maybe I think if in my era, if, if somebody was going to play my part, I think you'll bring her. Would fit the 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 situation perfectly. So, aye, big yo, I think would uh, you know if he was still around, I think that would have been a good a good thing for me. And do you know you've now got me going to be going back and watching uh, a shot at Gory tonight and looking for this bit. It was it was brilliant as well. It was brilliant as well because <clears throat> the diet McCoist McCoist had been told that he was going to score a goal with an overhead kick. And Ali Maxwell was in goals for the other team. And they said, the director said to Maxwell, don't, don't say that, you know. Uh, the idea was, uh, I think it was Tony Ruggi was going to go down the wing, cross the ball in, McCoy was to do an overhead kick and the ball was to go screaming at the back of the net. 16 takes later, you know, McCoy eventually connects one. And I think Maxwell, Ali, Ali had forgotten he wasn't to save it. And Ali dived and tipped it to the bar, you know, and the director was going, director was going bananas. Look, John, I really, really appreciate you taking the time to come on today. Um, I know 
off camera we had a few kind of technical issues and, and there was a few things happening and um, really appreciate your patience really appreciate you coming on um, and thanks so much for coming on and kind of sharing your views and stories and things I really no appreciate problem, it. mate. It's always it's always good to have a wee trip in the memory lane for myself. So I I forget about some of the things that happen. So it's nice to be to to recall them. Yeah, lovely. Thanks very much. See you later. Cheers. Thank Cheers. You. Bye. Bye.